We're in Spring Hill today at the beautiful Allenbrook Farms. I think quite possibly this is the most picturesque farm that I've ever visited. Not only are they doing vegetables, they also are branching out into flowers and other things. Dan's enthusiasm and passion for what he does is simply infectious. I'm here with Dan in one of his beautiful farm fields. Um, I have to note first the soil. How do you get it looking so rich and beautiful? We are very heavy with cover crops, so that's a big part of my rotations is I do cover crops for a year on every piece of every garden before, um, before we plant a cash crop in it. And then we fallow it out to get weeds out and cover crop it again. This is some Minuet Napa cabbage over there. I like that variety because it's a little bit smaller so you don't end up with these giant huge heads that like maybe one or two person can't eat by themselves. Yeah, and we must say that you are a CSA as well. So you are farming for a lot of people. So. Yes, yes ma'am. And it's good when the vegetables fit in the baskets and sometimes those big Napa cabbages <laughs> tend not to. And so in front of me right here? Um, this is some uh, Toscano kale or dinosaur kale or Lassionato kale, has a lot of different names. Um, it's just your standard big green kale is good for juicing and that sort of thing. And right here in front of me? Red Russian, and this is my favorite. It's a little bit sweeter. It's good in salads and raw. Um, I love this one. This is uh, curly green kale. Um, this variety is called dark boar, really prolific plant makes really nice curly green leaves um, just a great all-around kale everybody likes the green curly stuff I typically for my CSA will harvest the day before seeing as how we just have one a week that's on Wednesdays and they're all day long sometimes I'll do just a little bit the day before so I've got enough for the first people that come through and then we'll harvest fresh that day for everybody else I noticed there's no critter bite marks on anything what do you do for pests my pest management is a little bit different than everybody else's I guess <laughs> I typically don't spray any pesticides okay. out here so with the fields of cover crop and trap crops I plant around a lot of what is a trap well, a trap crop is a crop like I'll let the collard greens and the kales from the fall go to flower. A little bit left right over here. Is that the yellow flowers we're starting to see there? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Um, they've actually, a lot of the plants have made seed pods now, so it's almost time to get rid of it, but I'm trying to let it have every last second it can because I'm scared when I mow it down, it's going to come here. And as well as the cover crops like buckwheat, they'll like to go there instead of here. And that really boosts up the predatory insect population okay and i feel like if you're spraying you're killing them and you're killing their food source so the more they have to eat the better they do and then there's always the you know one third rule of planting extra for the bugs <laughs> just in case dan what else do you have growing in this field here well i have some late potatoes some mid-season potatoes the three kales napa cabbage savoy cabbage broccoli some early cone cabbage some cauliflower storage cabbage collard greens swiss chard looks like some romaine lettuce and a little bit of kohlrabi down there i know this is a family farm yes, it was your family's farm mm -hmm. and how long have you actually been thrown all the way into this farming this is i believe my eighth season full time so um eight and a half years I've been I've been farming full-time and you're still smiling primary job. yeah it's fun <laughs> I like it um it's kind of like getting to paint a new picture on a really cool canvas every year I'm also starting flower operations we have a wedding barn here so I'm doing some flower experiments and I've got a half acre dedicated to that and will you take those to market or is it going to be a you pick this year really I want them just for the pretty if they're pickable I'm sure they'll use some at the weddings and my wife will figure out something pretty to do with them but otherwise it's really just a backdrop for the wedding photos so Dan we're in almost the middle of May I'm really interested in your carrots in the bushel baskets tell me about that um, well, it's just a little experiment I thought I'd do this year um, for the CSA. I, I thought it'd be neat if the kids at the CSA could harvest their own carrots. Um, so it's just kind of an experiment I'm doing and it's turned out pretty good. And they're deep enough so they can get a nice, nice straight growth it looks yeah, like. Yeah, they're getting a nice straight growth because they're not hitting any rocks or anything. So they should come out looking pretty nice. And I think the kids will really enjoy it. Yeah. Let's walk up here and see what else you have going on. I see tomatoes. Let's talk about these tomatoes here. Um, let's see what kind we got. So this is a Lebanese tomato that um, 
First year farming, my dad had a whole bunch of old seeds that he'd been saving. He was always a tomato seed saver guy uh -huh. um, that we found in his deep freeze. And this was one of them that I really liked and I've grown it every year. Um, it's really heat tolerant. It makes a nice little kind of like plum salad tomato, but with a thin like pink brandywine kind of skin on it. So it's, you're saving seeds every year? I well. save seeds every year um, off of basically every heirloom tomato I grow because they seem to have more vigor um, as generations go through and be able to be more disease resistant. Um, really nice little tomatoes. These are ready to go in the field. And so when you plant them, do you plant them really deep like you're supposed to, or I've heard you're supposed to? Um, actually, I don't. We use a water wheel transplanter and we just shove them in the ground. And then um, as we cultivate, if it's needed, sometimes we'll throw, we'll throw um, soil onto it to give it a little bit more support, but they tend to, tend to do fine just like... How long do typically do you think that you harden things off before they grow, go in the field? Well, it depends on the weather. A lot of times if, if we have, we like to put everything out on cloudy days or right before, if we know we're gonna have a couple days of rain. So we can put them out on those days and by the time the sun hits, they're a couple days later, they're good to go. Um, if we have to bring them out when it's really hot and bright and sunny, then we'll cover them and only give them a few hours of daylight the first, first couple days and we gradually back it off until they can take the full sun without burning. Dan, I'm impressed. You're never bored here, obviously, because you go from vegetables to flowers to strawberries, and now you are doing what? Um, well, we are doing industrial hemp this year for CBD production. And you were t telling me a little while ago that you started this from seed 17 days ago? 17 days ago, yeah. They're pretty vigorous growth. They're feminized seed, certified feminized seed. Looks like they've already, I mean, seven, eight inches in and a good root ball already in just a, you know. So from this point, how long will it take for you before you set them out in the field? Um, I'm hoping to get these hardened off and out in the field in about two weeks for a little bit of early crop um, to try to get maybe a little bit extra vegetative growth before they start to flower this season. And then I have some more starting for later. And you were talking about how you like to do the seeds and not cloning? Well, I've chosen to do a mainly feminized seed this year. There's lots of, been lots of good innovations in the seed over the past couple years, especially out of Colorado. So I'm doing a bunch from them. Apparently the clones don't really have tap roots and that's something that I really want to have in our heavy soils to go down and catch the water. Yeah, so it looks like they're saying that one out of every 4,000 will be a male. So we might have 1.25 males in this whole batch. Wow. And so, do you need the males to... You, on CBD production, you want the males to go away. Okay, okay, I'm not familiar with that, yeah. so I, I was confused. You want only, um, only female plants so that they can make a f flower rich with CBD oil for medicine. Okay. Thank you for sharing with our viewers your wide array of your interests and, and, and your farming techniques. Well, thank you all for coming out. Come back anytime you want. Thanks. For inspiring garden tours, growing tips, and garden projects, visit our website at volunteergardener.org or on YouTube at the Volunteer Gardener channel and like us on Facebook.